As we look at the potential risks that may arise around the Korean Peninsula, it's obvious that the DPRK looms large. The North Korean toolbox of international engagement is pretty small. It consists primarily of provocations, threats, coercion, aggression, and intimidation. Yet the risk that is perhaps even more existential for the Republic of Korea and the U.S. is emanating not from the DPRK, but I would argue from its erstwhile ally, the People's Republic of China. We need to recognize and acknowledge that the PRC has chosen systemic competition with the United States, our allies, and our partners in its attempt to rewrite the existing order, the one that I referred to that was established after 1945, in a manner that benefits the PRC. They view competition along all facets of national power, economic, technological, political, and military, not to mention the CCP's influence operations on our campuses, amongst, against our journalists, and others whose worldview does not comport with that of Beijing. This mindset is a throwback to rivalries of the past and relies upon a similarly anachronistic tenet, might makes right. Beyond the tenuous history of Korean-Chinese relations over the millennia, and I have to share, I once had a senior Blue House official cite 972 instances of Chinese aggression against the Korean people throughout history. And he was very clear, there have been 972. The ROK most recently felt the brunt of Chinese aggression and coercion in the aftermath of the ROC government's decision to allow the deployment of a single THAAD battery at the height of an imminent military crisis with North Korea in 2017. We all remember the economic costs that China imposed on South Korea. And we know that the so-called three no's from the Moon administration remain hotly debated and, frankly, in my opinion, a clear example of infringement on South Korean sovereignty. But I'm happy to note that your foreign minister on the 10th of August stated that the, three, the so-called three no's is not a commitment to China, despite the growing pressure from Beijing. In order to dominate the free and open order, China understands that they must divide the U.S. alliance and partner network. We must guard against Chinese Communist Party opportunism. We are better and stronger when unified with our allies and partners, sharing the burden of peace to prevent war. We understand the co costs of systemic competition if it escalates into open conflict. Most importantly, we understand that constant reliable readiness is required to deter conflict. We are committed to deterrence as the most effective way to avoid conflict, both here on the peninsula as well as in other adjacent areas. And the alliance between our two countries has a critical role to play in this deterrence. The reality is that we have shared interests and matters that go beyond the peninsula. Each party recognizes that the armed attack in the Pacific area on either of the parties in territories now under their respective administrative control or hereafter recognized by one of the parties as lawfully brought under the administrative control of the other would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with its constitutional processes. Why do I cite Article 3? Because I would imagine that many not just in the United States, but in South Korea as well, are, do not think of the Mutual Defense Treaty in terms beyond the peninsula. And I would highlight the United States has territories in the Pacific, such as Guam, that are at the center of a variety of potential threats. And this is something that could, in fact, implicate our Mutual Defense Treaty as well. And it would be naive, if not negligent, for us to think that China's continued aggression against others in the region would not implicate our alliance. Thus, I think it's a priority task for us to think how we can, together, as well as singularly and in concert with other like-minded liberal democracies, stand up to Chinese revanchism to strengthen deterrence. This includes contingency planning involving the strategic flexibility of U.S. forces in Korea in case deterrence fails in the Indo-Pacific, because if it does, it will most certainly involve all of us, whether we want it to or not. The administration in which I served in 2017 released a national security strategy and, and, and a national defense strategy in 2018, where it was made very clear that we find ourselves in an era of great power competition. And both documents articulated our, vi our vision to compete, deter, and win against revisionist competitors such as China, as well as Russia. From a U.S. perspective, what happens on the Korean Peninsula will have global effects. 
whether there's war, regime collapse, you know, instability, uh, you know, the mother of all humanitarian interventions, uh, whatever happens on the Korean Peninsula is going to affect the world and affect Americans back home. Supply chains will be interrupted, uh, the potential for, for conflict to spread uh, beyond the peninsula. Uh, I mean, these are really, really, uh, you know, terrible, terrible things. It is the presence of U.S. forces that contributes to deterrence. And the one common goal that I think all Koreans and all Americans have is to prevent war on the Korean Peninsula. I think that's what we, we are really focused on. And when Hwang jong yap defected in 1997, you know, we asked him why Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il had not resumed hostilities. They've spent so much money on, their, on, on North Korean People's Army and, and, uh, you know, and trying to develop nuclear weapons at the time. Why haven't they resumed hostilities? And his answer was the presence of, of American forces. You know, and, and he made a couple of comments. He said, they know that they cannot defeat South Korea if South Korea has U.S. support. Uh, and the second thing he said, they believe that if they attack the South, that the U.S. will use nuclear weapons against the North, uh, which I think says two things. Uh, one, our declaratory policy works. And the second is that it shows us why North Korea has been in such you know, pursuit of development of nuclear weapons, which of course dates back to the 1950s. And, and I think, you know, it's not a new phenomena. It didn't just start in the 1990s, but deterrence of war is, is the number one uh, uh, reason. Now, the alliance, as Heino said, is a global alliance. And one of the things I'd really like to point out, um, as President Yoon has said, South Korea is a global pivotal state. You know, he wrote in uh, his foreign affairs article, you know, that South Korea is going to step up. I see South Korea now as joining partner, as a partner with the U.S. in the arsenal of democracy, the or development of weapons for friends, partners, and allies. We see the, the military deals that are being made with NATO countries. You know, and of course, President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida attended the NATO conference in Spain. These are, are really... Uh, an example of our alliance maturing. And, and it's important to both countries. Uh, so prevention of war. Now the second thing, point I want to make is that uh, North Korea as a threat, we know the nuclear threat. We know the threat to South Korea. But it's also a proliferator. It also proliferates weapons and training to conflict areas around the world. It conducts cyber attacks around the world. It conducts global illicit activities, counterfeiting money, counterfeiting medicine, trafficking in meth methamphetamines. Uh, and so this peninsula, uh, <laughs> there is a lot, you know, people say it, it punches above its weight. You know, we'd like North Korea to stop punching. Uh, but there is so much that, that, is, that, that emanates from this peninsula, good and bad, that it needs to be a focal point. And I'll just make the last comment. Mm -hmm. I am grateful for the, the military professionals, uh, the, the diplomats, you know, who worked in the Pentagon and the State Department who have to manage the alliances. You know, the United States has to walk and chew gum. We have global responsibilities uh, and, and global interests. Uh, and Korea is one alliance uh, that, that we do. But we're fortunate that Korea steps up uh, and is part of that alliance structure. I think we all know that uh, from the U.S. national security perspective, that alliances are key to our national security. And I think they are key to our alliance partners as well.